Uh, good afternoon. Nice to see you all again. Um, can I have my first slide, please? Uh, so when the slide arrives, it just, oh, here's the title. Um, so what you can see on this slide is my name at the bottom, my Twitter handle. If you're a Twitter person, I tweet about vaccines, not about football or breakfast or anything else. Um, uh, and at the top, there's a URL for a TED Talk. It's an animated TED Talk about pertussis uh, vaccine tran and transmission of pertussis, which you might find interesting. It's relevant to the uh, topic we're talking about this afternoon. Um, and I'm to talk to you about vaccines and mucosal immunity. I'm going to do two things, really. One is to try and make the case of why mucosal immunity is important in vaccinology with some epidemiological examples and some conceptual examples. I'll try not to take up too much time doing that so that I can uh, save some time at the end to actually give you some immunology to add to what you've learned already today from Claire Ann. Um, but uh, I guess the unifying principle of this talk is that if you really want to have a good vaccine, you need a vaccine that will break the chain of uh, transmission within the population. And that's what we, as it turns out, don't have with our COVID vaccines, certainly not with the current variants. We've got vaccines that are very good at protecting you against serious disease and ending up in hospital, but they're not doing very much at all to prevent the transmission of the virus in the population at large. So that's a real deficit for these vaccines. But for many of the vaccines we have, they work really well in that regard. And that's where the mucosal immunity comes in. This was a headline in the newspaper in England, The Guardian on Saturday. Um, John Bell, who's a very eminent immunologist from Oxford, uh, making the point that we need vaccines against COVID that interrupt transmission. Uh, so I've got a lot of respect for John Bell, but actually uh, Rick Malley and I uh, published this in August 2020 in the New York Times saying exactly the same thing and pointing out that these vaccines really do need to be researched to interrupt transmission. Uh, but I think our uh, article had very little impact on what went on at the time. So uh, to get a handle on what we're talking about, we need to just get some concept. And, and when we talk about how vaccines work and what you've been learning about mostly today, is the on-target direct effects. And if you talk to just about anyone about a vaccine, that's the way it's understood. In other words, you give the vaccine to your child against that disease and your child does not get that disease. That's direct effect. And you, you, you multiply that by the population of the world and you immunize everyone and they all don't get sick. That's direct on-target effect. What we're also talking about is indirect effects. They're still on target. It's still measles vaccine. You're still preventing measles, but you're preventing it in people who've not been vaccinated or who have been vaccinated, but have not been protected by the vaccine. That's indirect protection. And mucosal immunity comes into it. It's not the whole story, but it's a very important part of that story, prevention of onward transmission. And that's simply because most of the infections that we immunize against are transmitted from one mucosal surface to another, either respiratory or gastrointestinal or urogenital. There are off-target effects of vaccines. You'll be hearing about those from Nigel Curtis next Monday. Um, uh, they can be downstream effects. So if you prevent a child from getting measles, you may also prevent that child from dying of pneumonia a year later because they don't have the immunoparesis that the measles would have caused if they'd had measles. So you've stopped a child dying of pneumococcal pneumonia by giving them measles vaccine. That's a downstream effect. But there are also potentially lateral effects. And this is a very new area of research. Mostly we know about BCG. There may be vaccines where you actually give the vaccine and the individual is not only protected against TB, but also against other infections as well. But that's a very new field, very controversial. A lot of what is said about that may not actually be, be true. Um, but we're talking about indirect effects, prevention of onward transmission. That's what this talk is about. Now, there's quite a long list of people who could be indirectly protected. It's not just people who refuse to get vaccinated. It may be people who haven't been eligible for the vaccine. Or there may be people who just simply haven't got around to receiving it. Maybe people who it's, in whom it's not safe to give them the vaccine if it's a live vaccine as well as the people down at the bottom who can't make an immune response, or in fact, people who are perfectly healthy have made their immune response, but it's worn off and they're no longer protected. That applies to me. Last week, I managed to get COVID, as a, even though I was fully immunized from my granddaughter, because my immunity had waned away and I was no longer protected. 
Fortunately, because I was primed, I didn't get sick and I was able to clear the virus very quickly. But nevertheless, indirect protection didn't work for me in this occasion because the vaccine didn't last for long enough and I didn't manage to avoid getting exposed. So there, aren't, there is more than one way in which vaccines can prevent onward transmission. The obvious example uh, is the lymphocyte on the left there killing an infected cell is sterilizing immunity. And this is primarily how measles vaccine, for example, induces indirect protection. If you've had measles vaccine two doses, you just don't get measles. If you don't get measles, you can't give measles to anyone else, sterilizing immunity. But also, the, the, the vaccine may be able to induce mucosal responses that even though you get the infection having been immunized, you don't infect other people. Those, that's where the mucosal immunity comes in, and I'll give you examples of that. There are a couple of other ways in which indirect effects can, can occur that don't have anything to do with mucosal immunity. So uh, the so-called transmission blocking vaccines against malaria and dengue, where you're actually using antigens that are expressed by the pathogen in the vector. So what you're actually doing is protecting the next person down the line of the chain of infection by preventing the vector from transmitting the infection onto the next person. All right. And then ring vaccination, which is shown on the right. This is, of course, the way that that Jenner's vaccine was finally used to eradicate smallpox by immunizing all the contacts of cases and all the contacts of the contacts, leaving the virus nowhere to go. And this has been used much more recently with the Ebola outbreak in, in Africa. So ring vaccination is another way of blocking transmission. But we're looking at bullet point two. So why do we need to know about mucosal immunity? Well, as I've been uh, arguing, it's because how many vaccines actually work in terms of their overall impact. We really do need these indirect effects to paper over the cracks of our vaccines and get really strong population effects. Um, we mentioned yesterday with David Salisbury, somebody raised the question, which ones don't work? Well, COVID, clearly, they're not very good. And tetanus is the great example of a vaccine where there's absolutely no indirect protection because you get the infection when you inject yourself with the spores from the soil. Um, and we normally find out about these indirect effects, these herd effects, after we implement the vaccines. All right, we, we don't really know about them in advance. And so it's very hard to put that into our calculations when we're trying to decide whether or not to use them. Now, uh, you might say, well, why is this such a, a rare subject? Why do we so seldom hear about this? And one of the main reasons you heard yesterday from Norman about regulation, the regulators don't get into this at all. You don't need to have indirect effects to get your vaccine license. So this is not on the list of things that people like Louis Jodar has to plan when he's planning a new vaccine development, because all you need to get a vaccine license <clears throat> is evidence on safety and either immunogenicity or effectiveness in the individuals who've been given the vaccine. The rest is a kind of bonus extra that the regulators don't get involved with. So the companies are not particularly motivated to put this into their equations, at least not until recently, but people are beginning to think again. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that there are no useful, uh, usable correlates of protection. We're working on this, but I can't take a sample of saliva from one of you and say whether or not you're likely to be uh, uh, reliably able to not onwardly transmit pneumococcus or COVID or whatever. We, we do need those kind of surrogates and correlates that you were hearing about from Andy earlier to make this more of a useful concept. The other point I wanted to make is that while it might be the case that mucosal vaccines, oral polio, nasal flu, are good at inducing mucosal immune responses and injected vaccines are good at inducing systemic responses, blood IgG responses, that's not exclusive. You do get blood responses to an oral vaccine and you do get mucosal responses. Uh, you do get um, uh, the other way around. I can't remember what I was saying now. Injected vaccines will also induce mucosal immune responses as well. Uh, final concept slide here. So you've learned this morning about the B cell. The B cell produces immunoglobulin, including IgG. It also induces immunological memory and Claire Ann's going to give you a session on that after this. But there is this semi-visible umbrella of herd immunity resulting from mucosal immunity that helps make our vaccines work. And you can't ignore those, or if you do, you ignore them at your peril and you make mistakes. A couple of examples. So this is rotavirus in the United States. The infants who received the vaccines in the mid uh, first decade of this century 
are in red and the one year and two year olds who did not receive the vaccine are shown in blue and green respectively. You can see by the second year of the program, the rotavirus disease has gone away in the cohorts who've not been immunized. All right, so you're seeing an indirect effect. You're seeing children who've not received the vaccine not getting rotavirus. Uh, this is another example, these virus-like particle vaccines against human papillomavirus, extraordinarily effective vaccines that you'll be learning about. They not only prevent cervical cancer, which of course takes a long time to show, they also prevent genital warts. These are genital warts data from Australia, who are early adopters of these vaccines. You can see direct protection there. The red line is the women who received or the girls who received the vaccine not getting genital warts. The blue line is those who did not receive the vaccine. But here are indirect effects. Here are men, heterosexual men, getting fewer genital warts. None of them have been immunized, but they're being indirectly protected. The men who have sex with men in black, obviously no change there because their exposure is not changed. They don't have sex with women. Uh, and it's also an age effect uh, for very old men over the age of 26 who are sexually invisible to young women. Uh, there's, no protective, <laughs> there's no protective effect. All right, uh, so the best example I think of all of, all of this uh, you heard about from David yesterday, meningococcal conjugates. We introduced this vaccine in the United Kingdom uh, at the turn of the century and the black line shows the target group dramatic fall off in men's C cases. But also in the green line, you're seeing a decline of cases in the over 20s who were not vaccinated. So this is an unexpected finding. Uh, these were vaccines designed for their direct protective effects. They were given to infants and young children to stop them getting sick. And what we found was that it actually stopped the um, carriage and onward transmission of these strains of meningococci. Uh, and that's reflected in what happened in the program. We started giving three doses of these vaccines at two, three, four months to infants. They were the target group, direct protection. As the penny dropped as to how these vaccines were actually working, we gradually took those doses and redistributed them first into one-year-olds, then into teenagers, and then we actually stopped immunizing infants altogether. The target group no longer being immunized, we're now immunizing the carriers, the transmitters who are the adolescents, and when we started seeing that rise in W disease that you heard about from David, right the way across the age range uh, in 2009 onwards in the UK, we immunized the teenagers who were the carriers, the transmitters, uh, and Shemez Ladani and the UK HSA team have just published the data showing the effectiveness of that program. That is a program that is entirely designed for its indirect effects. A very small minority of cases of meningococcus group W occur in teenagers. There are a lot more cases in the elderly and in very young children. We've protected those target groups by immunizing the transmitters. So there are good examples now of vaccines that are being deployed based on their indirect effects, their mucosal immune effects. This also applies to influenza. <clears throat> children, unlike COVID actually, uh, children are much more infectious for much longer when they get influenza than adults and older children. This is a picture of uh, Christmas time grand parenticide. So this young lady has just brought her H3N2 home from nursery. She's giving grandpa a Christmas kiss, giving him the flu, but also giving him the serotype three pneumococcus that will carry him off in mid January with his secondary bacterial pneumonia. All right, so you've got downstream effects again, uh, but you've got uh, a really important indirect potential effect here because by immunizing that young girl against flu, we could stop her grandfather from dying. These descriptive data, some of you may have seen 20 years ago, published in the New England Journal, Japan at the top, uh, US at the bottom, the gray bars of flu vaccine use. You can see the, the, the black lines are a drop in uh, excess respiratory mortality, which is essentially flu-related deaths in elderly people, uh, coinciding with the use of the flu vaccine, which was withdrawn after a vaccine scare in Japan. No such trend in the United States in the bottom panel, even though increasing use of flu vaccine in the uh, latter part of the century. What's the reason? What's the difference? The difference is who's getting the flu vaccine in Japan. It's school aged children. In uh, America, it's elderly people and risk groups. So indirect protection, descriptive evidence. So much uh, more controversy over that. But there is good quality randomized control prospectus uh, evidence for this. These are cluster randomized studies done in Canada in small rural communities, immunizing some clusters, some villages, the children against flu, those are the yellow dots, and others 
uh, other clusters, the children being immunized against hepatitis A, the red dots, and then looking in the white dots, the adults, to see if you've prevented flu. And hey, presto, you do. Flu vaccine uh, given to children in these communities stops the adults from getting PCR-proven flu. In the UK, we introduced the nasal flu vaccine in the early part of last decade, and we did pilot uh, studies in school-aged children initially. The red areas are primary school children, the green secondary school children. Uh, and again, you can see a drop in excess respiratory mortality, that is flu-related deaths in old people in the areas where the primary school children got immunized against flu. So evidence that you can protect old people from flu by immunizing children against the disease. So uh, I hope I've gone through that fast enough to give us some time to actually talk some immunology because that was mostly epidemiology. Um, the mucosal immune system. So this is protection uh, against invasion, uh, against infections in the context of healthy colonization. The gut is full of bacteria. The respiratory tract is full of bacteria. You're not going for a sterilizing immunity here. You're trying to keep the peace. That's the blue helmet. You're trying to tolerate food antigens. You're trying to minimize inflammation. You're trying, trying to keep things under control. It's a very different idea from what you were learning about earlier, where you find the enemy and you wipe them out. Uh, one or two more analogies to give a sense of this. I'm guessing that Claire Anne will have given you the analogy of the party in the bar, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. So here's the party in the bar. So if the systemic uh, immunity is the nice, clean Swiss bar. Everything's very hygienic, all right? And everyone's uh, behaving rather nicely. The mucosal immune response is not like that. It's like this. This is a slum, all right? It's, a, it's full of bacteria. It's full of microbes. It's uh, inherently unstable. And what you're trying to do is to, is to get by in that situation. It's trying to not let things flare up. It's trying to keep the balance between fire and water. You don't want to have too much immunity. You don't want to have too little. If, the, uh, if, if what Clairin was teaching you about is a cruise missile with a target that you're trying to focus on and destroy, hopefully you get the right target and don't destroy a primary school too often. Uh, it, the the, the immu mucosal immune response is like the Green Party. You know, they're, they're trying to keep the peace in a complex world. Uh, they're, not, they're not trying to, to seek and destroy in the way that uh, the B and T cells you learned about earlier uh, do. Every mucosal surface has mucosal associated lymphoid tissue or MOLT. And although you might think uh, in terms of the immune system uh, about lymph nodes, about the spleen, about the bone marrow, about the bloodstream, most of your immunocytes are actually in lymphoid sites and actually most of those are in the gut. The gut is uh, something we don't think of usually as a lymphoid organ, but it is. Um, and in fact, it has its own phenotypically distinct sets of B and T cells and accessory cells. I'll show you some diagrams of those in just a moment. But we're trying here to maintain the balance. We're, we're trying to um, keep the peace. We're not trying to wipe out all of those foreign microbes because they're an essential part of what is you and they need to be left to get on with their business. <clears throat> uh, so here is, uh, let's look quickly at the if you like, the microscopic anatomy of the mucosal immune response. And the best example of that, the most developed, is the small intestine. Um, so what you've got here is uh, the villi, the two villi, and then microvilli on the epithelial cells. In, uh, in alongside those epithelial cells, you've got goblet cells producing mucus, that's the yellow stuff. Uh, you've got uh, M cells, which are specialized antigen-presenting cells. And then inside on the right there, you've got a pious patch, which is a fully developed germinal center. So the afferent sensory part of the immune system you're hearing about, there's B cells, there's T cells, there's antigen presenting cells there, sensing what's going on in the environment around. Further down at the bottom, you've got the lamina propria, which is the efferent part. You've got Bs and T cells there, producing the immune response, immunoglobulin from the B cells, plasma cells, mostly IgA. I'll tell you a bit more about IgA in a minute. You've got innate cells there, including innate lymphoid cells, which look like lymphocytes, but don't have specific receptors. Um, and you've got the other innate cells, macrophages and plasma cells. And there on the lumen on the right, you've got immunoglobulin, mostly dimeric IgA, and you've got antimicrobial peptides, which are the black dots. So that's the kind of the, the machinery that you've got in your mucosal immune system. In other parts, it's less well-developed. This is the, the large intestine, the same, same components, but not completely uh, fully developed 
um, 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 pay as patches. But what you find is that the more bacteria there are present, the more B cells there are present. There's a very strong association between the microbiome, the, the colonizing bacteria there, and the behavior of the immune, res the, the immune system around it. Um, and that turns out to be really important because different antimicrobial products and different types of antimicrobials uh, have different effects on the overall balance of inflammation on the right or uh, inflammation on the left or anti-inflammatory responses on the right. Uh, and actually what's in your gut at any one time, what your microbiome consists of uh, is critical to the function of the immune system. If you breed animals in a sterile environment and you don't allow their, uh, their naturally occurring colonizing bacteria to colonize the gut, then the evolution of their mucosal immune systems is completely paralyzed. It just doesn't occur, it just doesn't happen. So there's a yin yang here. There's a relationship between the bugs and the immune response that's going on all the time. Um, and I guess uh, it's fair to say that the, uh, this is a really hot area of research, but there are more questions than answers when it comes to vaccinology. There are lots of really hot questions being researched at the moment. Are, are the differences in the colonizing bacteria in different environments and different populations responsible for the differences that we see in immune responses to vaccines in different places? Um, the classic is the size of the immune response to Hib vaccines in Costa Rica versus uh, the United States. They're completely different, but we don't know why. Um, what about the different microbiomes that you see in babies who've been breastfed versus bottle fed? Does that affect how they respond to infections? Yes. Does it affect how they respond to vaccines? What about hormonal differences and gender differences, female, male differences? They exist. We don't really know what they're, uh, how important they are, or why they exist. Um, and uh, well, the list goes on. There are, there are many things that you can speculate may be going on here where one bug, uh, the presence of a bug, for example, before you immunize against it in your mucosal surface may influence how you respond to a vaccine when you get immunized. Watch this space. Um, a couple more diagrams. So here I want to introduce the idea of a T helper 17 cell. You've heard of CD4 cells, CD8 cells. CD4 cells are helper cells. They can produce different phenotypes, type 1, type 2. And type 17 is a, cyt a cytokine called IL-17, which is really important effector in the mucosal surface. Uh, it's affecting, you can see in this diagram, the behavior of the B cells and the production of IgA. Um, it also... Uh, interacts with neutrophils, that's the red cell on the right, so there are antibody independent mucosal uh, uh, interactions going on. It produces IL-22, which generates those uh, antibacterial peptides there in red on this one as they were in black on the other. Um, so you can see that these are really promising candidates for things to measure and understand uh, as we uh, try to understand responses to vaccines. Uh, I can't finish without telling you a bit about IgA. Uh, it's a bit of a mystery, this. It's the most abundant immunoglobulin that we make. Um, really large amounts of it in our mucosal surfaces. Um, the more microbes around, as I said, the more B cells, the more IgA you find, particularly in the colon. But interestingly, a quite a large proportion of the healthy population are IgA deficient, have more than two standard deviations below the mean for their age of IgA circulating. And yet many of those people are quite well. So we don't really know, uh, and, you know, you can't have no IgG and be well, you, you get sick, but you can have very low levels of IgA and stay relatively well, which is strange. It suggests that it's part of a multiple system, which uh, is compensated by other things. They do get sick. They do get more. Uh, some of them get autoimmune disease, more respiratory infections, GI infections, but nothing like what you see with hypogamma in little boys that have no IgG at all. Uh, so it's a classic uh, diagram. It's a dimeric molecule in humans uh, in the circulation uh, held together by the J chain. And then I want to explain to you what this so-called secretory piece is that we see on this immunoglobulin when we measure it in mucosal secretions. So uh, there's something called a polymeric IgA receptor, which you find at the basal level of epithelial cells. Uh, and it picks up the dimeric IgA that has been produced elsewhere by B cells and it transports it actively across the epithelial cell uh, to the luminal surface, where it's cleaved off, leaving part of the receptor attached to the dimeric molecule, and that's the secretory piece. Uh, and the rest of these 
the receptor is recirculated back to the basal level of the cell. So there's an active transport process of this IgA uh, onto mucosal surfaces. That's in contrast to IgG, which simply ends up there by a passive process. Um, you can measure IgA in secretions. This is just uh, two different ELISAs looking at saliva of antibodies to meningococcus C polysaccharide, showing you that the correlation between the secretory piece and the anti uh, meningococcal uh, IgA, anti IgA detection. So you can see that the amount of IgA in different individuals varies, but there's uh, uh, a quite a wide range on that logarithmic scale of the size of the immune response following vaccination. And I just finished with this data slide just to uh, get your taste buds going. These are preclinical unpublished data from uh, a group that I work with in Bristol, where we've, we've made a virus-like particle vaccine. Uh, it's an ad, uh, adenovirus-like particle, and, and we can engineer antigens onto the surface of this particle, protein vaccine. This one is a COVID vaccine being uh, trialed in mice. And the finding that I want you to, to pay attention to is that when we give this um, uh, this um, virus-like particle vaccine intranasally to these mice, we can induce uh, mucosal IgA responses against COVID. So going back to that very first slide I showed you from the newspaper story, uh, we, and of course other groups as well, are working hard on this idea that maybe we can induce mucosal immune responses by mucosally administered vaccines uh, that will have more of an impact, at least short-term, perhaps long-term, fingers crossed, uh, against these kind of infections in the future. So to finish, I hope I'm on time. Immunologists like to immunize mice and measure their sterilizing immune responses in blood. It's all nice and clean and Swiss. Parents like to have their children immunized with a vaccine on a spoon and not to measure immune responses at all. That would be their preference every time. Epidemiologists like herd immunity as did illustrated on the right. But vaccinologists like us, need to understand better how vaccines actually work. Thank you. Okay, that's going off already. <laughs> Let's stop. Thank you. Hi, thank you for that interesting talk. So when we were um, hearing from Dr. Seacrest earlier this morning, she talked about how over time the durability of uh, the, the antibody titers decline. And as they decline, you often see that mucosal immunity recedes first. And so when you are considering, for instance, the, the slide that you just showed where there was high intranasal, mm -hmm. um, sorry, high response from the mucosal immunity intranasal for after intranasal administration, is that, do you expect that high mucosal response to be durable or short-lived? Like if you are priming that zone, is mucosal immunity the, still the first thing to recede? How do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, sure. We, interesting, we were chatting about this over lunch earlier. I mean, I think my prediction would be that these would be relatively short-lived responses. But I think we've seen evidence, at least in the work we've done with bacterial mucosal immune responses, that there is such a thing as mucosal memory. So just in, and memory is coming up next, but uh, you know, there, essentially there are two types of vaccine failures, primary vaccine failure, which is where you just don't make a sufficient immune response to be protected. But there's secondary vaccine failure, which is when your immune response declines and you become vulnerable again. Now, if it's a slow incubation period infection and you've got memory, then you can, you can handle that. If it's a very fast incubation uh, infection, then memory may not be fast enough. So you could imagine that a mucosal immune response, if there's memory, uh, and if what you're trying to do is to reduce onward transmission, you're not trying to stop that person necessarily getting infection, the sterilizing immunity, you're just trying to make them less infectious. If they've got enough mucosal memory that they can summon up some IgA, if IgA is what matters, so that they don't then infect 10 other people, they only infect three other people, then you're going to uh, have an, uh, an onward effect. So I, I, maybe I've strayed slightly away from your answer, but the answer to your question is that they're likely to be quite short-lived responses, but that doesn't mean they don't matter or won't be useful. Uh, right, you're gonna be in charge, yeah. You be in charge. You, okay. Yeah, you be in charge. <laughs> okay, left one. Thank you for your presentation. I'm Daniel from Brazil. Um, 
I, I think the conjugate vaccines were a game changing, especially because of mucosal impact and the prevention of colonization. Can we learn something from the conjugate vaccine and, and apply to other platforms to improve mucosal uh, immunity? Well, okay. Um, yeah, I suppose the answer is that we possibly could. I, I don't see them as an exception. I mean, I think David's comment yesterday may have suggested that conjugate vaccines are quite remarkable and that they do this and maybe other vaccines don't. Whereas my sense is that for most of the vaccines we use, whether they're conjugate polysaccharides, protein vaccines, uh, or whatever, you, you will see some degree of mucosal response. And if you can, if you can maximize that, then you will, you will have, indir you will have an enhanced indirect effects. Um, I think the one thing that we can learn, though, from the conjugate vaccines is to remember that um, there are infections which don't make you sick or only exceptionally make you sick. And if you just target your vaccine on the serious illness and ignore all of that sort of mild colonizer, asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic colonization, then you're, you're potentially missing an opportunity. Um, and I think the other thing that we're thinking about more and more now beyond the conjugate vaccines, which are bacterial specific, is how do the viruses and the bacteria that inhabit the upper respiratory tract, how do they interact with each other and how do they depend upon each other? And to cut a long story short, would a better way of preventing bacterial infections be through the use of viral vaccines? You know, could, could we actually impact on what goes on with these bacteria by interfering with what viruses do? Hi, it's nice talk. My name's Elma. Um, Hi. Just a question. The intranasal boost uh, at the end or the intranasal delivery of COVID at the end increased. Was that a systemic prime intranasal boost? No, um, it, this is mice, right? It's not humans. Oh, okay. All right, it's mice. And they've just been given a two dose. Uh, so there, it was not a systemic prime. It was a double mucosal prime, but they were given two doses of nasal virus-like particle vaccine. And then we measured using an immunoassay, it's not a functional assay, just the fact that there was anti-S protein uh, IgA in their nasal secretions. Actually, I didn't have time to show you in detail, but one panel was upper respiratory and the other was lower respiratory tract IgA. <clears throat> so just is there evidence, or in your opinion, would a systemic prime with the mucosal boost be, would you get the best of both worlds? Possibly. Um, I mean, it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, I think one of the great attractions of mucosally delivered vaccines is that they're, they're really easy to deliver, right? Um, both in terms, of, I mean, that people repeatedly over yesterday were bringing up this issue of acceptability, not just do the vaccines work, but will people accept them? And I can tell you the UK experience is that mucosal vaccines, people just love them, all right? That people used to love oral polio vaccine, even though it used to cause polio. Um, and uh, um, people love the nasal vaccine because there's no needles involved. Um, so that, that, there is that aspect to it. Um, uh, and uh, it's not just acceptability, it, there's actual practical issues. You train someone to fill a syringe and inject a needle into a muscle. It's much more tricky to do than to just train someone to squirt something up somebody's nose or give them something to eat. So, so I think there are reasons to go for mucosal vaccines if we can make them work. Hi, uh, Hi, thank you for your lecture. I'm Setu from India, and I work at the community level with a lot of people. And um, what I heard from a lot of people was that despite the two doses of the COVID vaccine, and, and a lot of people were getting their antibodies tested. So they reported uh, that their antibodies levels were almost undetectable despite the two doses and after a couple of weeks. Uh, so how, how do you explain that? Okay, really important question. So uh, I, think, I think what we tend to do in vaccinology <clears throat> is we use a standard dose. We usually do some dose finding <clears throat> and then we use a standard dose. And then we go into phase two trials and we give a standard dose often in children actually, because that's where we use vaccines to children of a very particular age. We often select them to be well, and you know, because we want to standardize things. Uh, and we give it in a very 
clear way. And then we measure their response, usually with a blood sample after a fixed period of time, usually a month rather than two weeks. And uh, what we observe is whether we look at binding antibody or functional antibody titers, we see a range that goes over two orders of magnitude. And um, rather than think about that and saying, well, that's extraordinary, what we do is we make a geometric mean titer. So we have a single value and we compare that with another geometric mean titer. And we completely ignore all the heterogeneity that exists as if it was all the same. And then we even then will use correlates of protection around that geometric mean, ignoring the fact that a third of those people are below it. So we, we don't really address that question, but we do recognize the fact that the response that you make to a vaccine is very variable according to who you are and according to factors that we don't really understand. I mean, clearly, a, you've been hearing from Claire Anne, age makes a difference, uh, gender makes a difference. There are things that we do understand, but most of it we don't understand. Now, having said all of that, in your situation, they could have been using the wrong test. They could have been measuring it at the wrong time. We don't actually have an individual color, an individual color of protection for COVID. We don't know how much antibody you need to be protected. We've got some ideas about comparing the vaccines on a geometric mean titer, but we can't actually say to someone, well, you're not protected, you haven't got enough antibody, or indeed to someone else, you are protected because you have. We just don't have those tools at this point. So uh, a lot of people going off, you know, particularly doctors going off and measuring their antibody responses and fretting, but not actually, actually being able to interpret what they're looking at. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Mary Beth from Kenya, and um, I'm just trying to, to follow up from a question I had in the morning that I didn't ask because I thought it would be covered here. Mm. And really, in terms of when we give the vaccine, it was very clear that they multiply in the sort of like systemic uh, lymph nodes, but is there a way they also like the reaction also takes place in the, the visceral lymph nodes, so to speak, like in the malt system? And the reason I'm asking that is that clearly there was the IG antibodies, the IgG antibodies, but we didn't hear much about the IgA antibodies. And is there a differentiation where some of the antibodies that are made are um, IgA or you can only induce IgA through a local um, administration? And the reason I'm asking that is really, for example, with COVID, we know that the area of multiplication is in the upper respiratory tract. The receptors are there in, and they are also in the lungs and i'm just thinking that could then be the iga the missing link because we are looking at correlates of infection systemically but we i don't know maybe a lot of research now has gone on to look for other correlates of protection in the sort of like the natural pathway for um the disease the infective uh the cause of the illness through the natural infection yeah, I mean, I, I think your question more or less encapsulates everything I was saying in the sense that these are the questions, but by and large, we don't have the answers. However, I can partially answer your question. So uh, the work that we did from the 1990s onwards did show somewhat to people's surprise that if you put a conjugate polysaccharide protein antigen into a child's leg, you will see both IgA and IgG responses to that polysaccharide in their saliva, all right? And the, the, the duration of those responses are pretty similar to what you see in blood. So, you, you know, it's not correct to say that it all happens in the local lymph node and the bone marrow, because that IgA that you're seeing in the saliva is being, to a large extent, locally produced at the mucosal surface. So that was that, you remember that yellow and blue slide the point of that slide was to try and get you away from the idea that you have to give a mucosal vaccine to get mucosal responses, you have to give a systemic vaccine to get systemic responses, because you do get both from both. Now, that's, that's a, a simplified answer, because it's not as simple as that. And some of the time you do, and some of the time you don't. And ultimately, we still don't know the relative importance of those different isotypes in terms of the effect that those bacterial vaccines have, for example, on colonization. Is it IgG? Is the, what's the IgA doing? Is the IgA really antibacterial or is it more just an anti-inflammatory molecule or is it a bit of both? So those are the questions that, you know, I, I would get the, well, I wouldn't get the kind of feedback that Claire Anne gets uh, because no one can lecture as well as Claire Anne, but I would get more like the kind of feedback that she gets if I could answer these questions in this talk. But she's got, she's got talks to give where she has the answers. The problem with mucosal immune responses is that we have the questions, but we don't yet really have the answers. So 
that brings my feedback down. Questions are also good. We take the next one. <laughs> Uh, hi, Claire's um, here in the wings, so we don't have to be quick. <laughs> Catherine from Australia, um, you, you spoke a lot about the indirect effects of, um, you know, onward transmission of mucosal immunity, and I was just wondering, is that do you see that as the main advantage or the main role of mucosal immunity versus the direct protecting the individual against an infection? Yeah, good question. I, I, of course, you're right. I mean, in theory, at least in principle you could have sterilizing mucosal immunity, right? You could have either uh, the right cells or the right antibodies that the virus arrives and it just can't make any progress. You know, it can't bind to the ACE2 receptor. It can't infect the epithelial cells and bingo. So you're home and dry. So uh, uh, mucosal immunity doesn't have to be only about onward transmission. It can be part and probably is part of, the, of, of that holy grail of sterilizing immunity that we would like to have. All I'm really trying to do here is to extend beyond that a little and say, well, it, you know, it could be useful not just as sterilizing immunity, but also in terms of the infectiousness of the individual. Because, well, with COVID, we've seen these vaccines simply don't stop you getting infected. But if they do stop you getting infecting other people or could, that would still be really valuable. The last question from Duncan. Okay. I'm Abiola from Nigeria. Is my question is all prevention transmission vaccines, do they all give mucosal immunity? So the, uh, do you remember this slide where I gave you like four bullet points of ways in which you could prevent onward transmission? Mm -hmm. So um, you don't actually necessarily need mucosal immunity in order to prevent onward transmission. So, and I gave you the example of vector uh, targeted vaccines or ring immunization. Your question is slightly different though. It's a kind of, it, can you, you're almost asking me, could you imagine a vaccine where you get a systemic immune response and there is no mucosal immune response? Yes. And I, like I haven't seen an example of that. Okay. All right. I don't know if Claire Ann can give you one, but I've not seen an example of that. In other words, whenever anybody has bothered to look, there has been some signs of a mucosal immune response. Now, how functionally useful that is, is another question. But if you just simply want to go look, if you've got IgG in your blood, you will have some IgG in your, uh, in your gut, in your respiratory tract, in your lungs that will be there because it will simply get there. And in fact, if you've made an IgA response, there will be IgA in your mucosal secretions too. So yeah, I think that's probably the worst. So the best lymph thing. nodes in the gut that secrete the immunoglobin B, the, uh, so the T cell and the B cells, so if you, the if lymph you, nodes in the guts, yeah, if you, if you do a, um, a color-based isotype staining of B cells in the, in the small intestine, the large majority of them will be IgA secreting, but there will be IgG secreting uh, plasma cells there too. It's just that it's predominantly IgA. And, and of course, you have the same isotype switching process going on there as you do, uh, as you were hearing about earlier. So the, these cells will go in the direction of one or another isotype as they mature. Thank you. Great. Thank okay. you very much. We have to conclude that session. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for the very active question session. And we move on.